This is a Whole Observatory podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Haley Osborne with a new episode of Star Stuff. Uh, today, I am joined by the Grand Canyon's most recent astronomer in residence. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hoffman. I'm from the University of Denver, but I am heading to the Grand Canyon to start as the next astronomer in residence as of March 8th. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I, I totally forgot you work in Denver. I uh, actually grew up in Colorado. Really? Oh, yeah. great. <laughs> so I go back there very frequently. And Wonderful. University of Denver is a, a pretty cool area. So. It's a fun place to live for sure. <laughs> nice. Well, um, before we get super into it, uh, why don't we go ahead and start off with what exactly is an astronomer in residence at the Grand Canyon? Well, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> yeah. Fair. <laughs> so, uh, but I understand that the astronomer in residence gets to live on site in the National Park in the visitor center, one of the nice. visitor centers, and contribute to the Grand Canyon's programs, public programs, during the time of the residency. So I get some time to do my own research, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm on sabbatical right now, so I'm, nice. I'm working on some research projects as part of that. But I also get to contribute my expertise to the programs that they have going on and and um, start some new ones. So That's I'm really looking so forward cool. to that. Yeah. So um, we actually recently had uh, the last astronomer in residence on, and uh, we talked to him about what he was doing there. And he actually mentioned that he was doing uh, this like series of talks there. Are you? Is that something you're doing as well? Yeah, I'm doing fewer um, formal talks and more kind of um, hands-on experiments with oh, the public. Cool. I'm really invested in getting people to look at the sky and track changes in the sky to sort of understand that the sky is variable, right? Mm -hmm. And that's predictable, that there are cycles and changes that we can be aware of and, and understand how they affect our lives. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited to be here at this time because we're coming up on the spring equinox. Mm -hmm. um, that's on the 20th. And so during or around the equinox, the sun is moving very quickly through the sky, not on a daily basis, yeah. but but um, on the celestial sphere, going from, from south of the equator to north of the equator, and that's what changes the seasons. Nice. Uh, so the equinox is the day that it crosses the equator. And the way that we can see this most easily um, is to look at where it's setting, well, rising or setting, but <laughs> it's going to be a little easier in the, in the evening. Um, where, look at the point where it's setting on the horizon. And mm -hmm. on the equinox, it sets due west, and before the equinox, it's a little bit south of that. And <laughs> as, after the equinox, it's a little bit north of that. So, gotcha. and it's moving its fastest at this time. And so mm -hmm. if we go out every night and just kind of map where it sets mm -hmm. on the horizon, we should be able to track that motion. Um, now, I know that I'm not going to get the same group of people every night yeah. at the Grand Canyon, <laughs> um, but I have this idea uh, that if we set up kind of a tripod with a cell phone mm -hmm. mount, we can have people take pictures of it, and then I can put all the pictures together, and we can kind of do a time lapse ah. so that um, people can see the movement of the sun that they wouldn't be able to experience directly. That's so cool. And how long are you going to be there? Uh, six weeks. So we have plenty of time nice. to do some long-term stuff like this. Perfect. Yeah, that's a that's a great amount of time to get that kind of a time lapse in. Right. And I'm going to do some other things like moon phases, nice. um, sh movement of the shadow. Uh, of a flagpole or something. So, so mm -hmm. various things that are designed to get people noticing their surroundings and, and thinking about their connection to the sky. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I like to, um, think about that kind of stuff and just like, um, like humans have been doing that kind of stuff for so long, you know, exactly. I mean, like wayfinding, ancient wayfinding for sure was similar stuff, you know, uh, just doing like checking out your surroundings and looking at how, uh, the sky moves and everything. And, um, I actually wrote a, a talk about that a while ago. We didn't end up using it, but it was like one of my favorite things. Um, for sure. so that's really cool. And it's even a kind of science, right? Because you, mm -hmm. you make observations, you, you start to understand them. You start to be able to predict things, yeah. right? And so, as you say, ancient people use the movement of the sky to organize their lives, to know mm -hmm. when to plant, to know when to move on to the next campsite. Right? Yeah. I mean, it used to be a, 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 an integral part of life. And I think we kind of lost touch with that, right? Because yeah. now we're, we're so separate from the sky. Um, most mm -hmm. of us live in places where it's very bright at night and we can't really see, you know, we don't even think, it, think about it that much unless yeah. there's some big thing that happens like an eclipse or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, a meteor shower. Mm -hmm. Most of us are aware of things like that, but on a daily basis, it's not really a part of our lives anymore. And I'd like to bring that back a little bit. That's so cool. That's so cool. So is this something 
you've like specialized in in the past or is this just something you're passionate about? Yeah, not really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I've been thinking about for a while uh -huh. um, because my research is about things in deep space that mm -hmm. change over time or that cycle over time. And it occurs to me that I'm not sure that many people think of space that way. I, I yeah. think that many people think of space as kind of eternal and unchanging and it's always there and it's always mm -hmm. the same. Um, and that makes it hard to understand, I yeah. feel like. So thinking about these changes that we can experience on a human time scale, I'm hoping we'll give people a little bit more of a an entry into, yeah. into understanding it. That's so cool. Yeah. Bringing like your your cosmic work down mm -hmm. to like an earth base. Yeah, level. absolutely. I, think that's so awesome. I really don't want it to be separate and like, oh, there, you know, she's so smart. She's like way up there. And I can't, <laughs> I, I can't do anything like that or understand anything like that. It really, you know, it's not like. <laughs> right. It, it used to be, astronomy used to be, as we were just talking about, inseparable from daily life. It used mm -hmm. to be a very communal thing. And yeah. I think we should get back toward that. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that's such a cool thing. So, um, I actually didn't tell you, uh, my background, but my background's in physics. Mm -hmm. And so I've been teaching about astronomy here at the observatory for about six years now, but I've never like been super into the research or anything. But what's so cool to me about astronomy versus something like physics is like, you can be an amateur astronomer, right? But you can't be like, an amateur physicist, it's harder, you know, right? like what is that? What does that really <laughs> yeah, mean? Yeah. What does that look like? You can't really, really do it. And so, like this idea of bringing these like crazy cosmic things down to an Earth-based level or down to an amateur level, mm -hmm. it's just such an interesting concept. You know, yeah. I, I think about that a lot. So I think that's really cool. For sure. <laughs> it's very accessible to a lot of people. I think of it as a gateway science. Like yeah. For a lot of people, it's the first science that they're interested in. That and mm -hmm. dinosaurs, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> for the kids. Mm -hmm. And so if we're serious about science education, science literacy in the country, it's a great starting point. Yeah, definitely. And and you're um, really into science education as well, right? Uh, this is something that uh, I saw in your bio. Right. Do you want to talk about the the camp that you were yeah, with? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I'm as I mentioned, at the Uni University of Denver, and I have some colleagues in the biology department there. I'm in physics and astronomy. Oh, cool. But I have some biology colleagues who are equally interested in mm -hmm. science education. And we've been um, thinking about our field and how our field, the composition of our field doesn't really reflect the composition of our neighborhoods and our society as a mm -hmm. whole. Um, astronomy and biology, actually both are doing pretty well in terms of uh, representation of women overall, so that's really good, but, mm -hmm. but we still don't have a, a great racial and ethnic diversity in our field. And as we started learning more about this, we learned that it is not a question of who's interested in science. It is not a question of who's capable of doing science. It is a question of the opportunities that people have, especially when they're young, and especially when they're sort of forming the their their ideas about what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. um, for some people <laughs> who tend to be boys and who tend to be white and who tend to be mm -hmm. well off as kids, it's a lot easier to consider being a scientist. And for some people from low income families or people of color, especially girls of color, it's just mm -hmm. not as much of a thing yeah. culturally, right? And mm -hmm. so we um, have developed a summer camp that's aimed specifically at girls of color um, and at an age when Research has shown that girls are starting to lose interest in science or or starting to it's not as I said, it's not really interest starting to starting to lose confidence, yeah, right starting to not think of it as something that they can do. Um, and so our program brings middle school girls uh, from the Denver area, and we've we've historically been able to to have a, quite a high um, ethnic diversity and um, income diversity, a lot of low income. Mm -hmm girls um, and brings them to campus. And for a week, it's a day camp. So we, we have them come to campus um, mm -hmm. and basically do fun science stuff. So it's <laughs> all hands on. We do um, insect collecting projects. Oh. We make circuits with Play-Doh. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we do computer programming. We do telescopes. Nice. Uh, we go on field trips to the science museum. Um, and we try to introduce the girls to as many women scientists as we can and as many women of color in science as we can. We have yeah. great grad students who help us out with this as peer mentors, and we bring back uh, campers from previous years to serve mm -hmm. as peer mentors as well. Yeah. Um, the great thing about it is we've had funding that has allowed us to make it free for families. Uh, the, those of you who are parents out there know how expensive summer camps can be. <laughs> yeah. And it's a huge <laughs> barrier to many people. Yeah. Um, so, so we have funding that allows us to 
to offer this for free. And not okay. only that, we give the girls all the stuff. They go home with their telescopes and their computers oh and goodness. their insect collecting kits <laughs> so that, right, they can do science at home. It's not yeah. so that the message is you don't have to be in a lab, you don't have to be yeah. on a campus. Uh, it's something that you can can do yourself. And we have gotten really great feedback um, mm. from the girls and from the parents. And the things that have meant the most to me are when the parents say, it's amazing, you know, my daughter uh, came right home and like started showing her siblings how to use the telescope or like, how to sh showing her friends how to do the computer programming. Aww. So that tells me that the girls are like attaining an expertise, right? They're yeah. starting to think of themselves as somebody who can do this stuff and not only do it, but show it to other people, yeah. right? And that's what we're aiming for. It's that sort of ownership that mm -hmm. it, there's a term for it uh, called scientific self-efficacy. It's like, uh -huh. do you think of yourself as somebody who could do science? Yeah. And that seems to be the key. Again, research has shown that that is one of the keys um, to people deciding to mm -hmm. pursue science as a career. Yeah. So um, it, it's awesome that you're bringing up all these topics. These are actually a couple of things that we've talked about on the podcast before. Great. So we've done episodes on things like imposter syndrome. So yeah. that's uh, basically what you're talking about, but like you're already in the field and then you just don't feel mm -hmm. like you belong there. You know right, what I mean? Right. And um, I was looking up uh, statistics of it and like statistically it is much higher in women yeah. in STEM fields. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that we did an entire episode on. Sure. And the thing about imposter syndrome is it it's not necessarily all in your head, right? Yeah. Because the field is really not set up for women. Exactly. So it's not, yeah, yeah. it's not surprising that people feel that way. In many ways, the mm -hmm. field is still um, hostile. To, Absolutely. To m minority groups or minoritized groups, I should yeah. say. Yeah. And it's like, even, even if you do find a program that isn't, you know, hostile or doesn't feel technically feel like that. Like I got into a program a couple of years ago and I was the only woman in the program. Mm. I was the only woman in my class. There were women in the grades above me, but there were like four of us total, you know? And it's like, it's, it was 2020. I was, yeah, I was, I was like, say, I can't so believe. That happened to it's me insane. in college, but that was, you know, yeah. 30 years ago. The fact that this was three years ago is just uh, insane to yeah. think about. And so uh, I talked a little bit about that and how just like weird it was. Mm -hmm. And like, to be fair, it was a really small program. Right. I think there were only like seven of us. And right. so like, I, I get it out on some level, but at the same time, it's just like, yeah, it, it just didn't feel great, right. <laughs> you know? That's um, discouraging. And then um, at the same time, I was experiencing academic burnout, you mm -hmm. know, and we had an episode about that um, where we actually talked about, uh, about it with two of my old classmates, uh, two females in uh, physics, That's and we great. talked about it. Uh, so that was a fantastic episode as well. Yeah. But it's just like, it's crazy that like, um, I forget, I feel like it was Bill Nye, maybe it, it was someone like him, um, was mentioning like, oh yeah, like every little kid is a scientist. Every mm -hmm. little girl Absolutely. is a scientist, you know, they're, they're super into asking like why about everything or how does this work or like constantly asking questions yeah. and performing science every day. But then at some point it, that interest just like it, it not necessarily, like you said, the interest, but the like, oh, I could do this. Yeah, and the identification with it, right? It has something mm -hmm. to do with the acculturation process that happens when we go yeah. through puberty, right? And we start to care about what our friends think mm -hmm. and what society thinks. And Absolutely. yeah, and it's unfortunate. It really is sad to sort of see that light quenched in people. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because like like my, my interest in science and everything fizzled out for a while there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really lucky in high school to have an incredible calculus teacher, have really cool science teachers. And so I got back into it, you know, yeah. um, and that was fantastic. And then I actually started studying physics because of the observatory, because I had the observatory wow. here. I had moved here um, with you know, I was just living with a friend here in Flagstaff and I started coming here and I was like, this is so cool. And it like piqued my yeah, curiosity again, fantastic. you know, yes. but not everybody has that. So like the fact that you guys have this camp and that, that it's like free and you mm -hmm. give them all of this stuff to take home, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're really looking forward to continuing it. It's been a little sporadic because the mm -hmm. funding has not been guaranteed. We, yeah. we've, we're kind of year to year on the funding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if if we are able to attract longer term funding, we would love to expand and do things mm -hmm. like 
um, longer term mentoring. So I love to go back and visit the camp alumni in their mm-hmm. classrooms and like find out did they go to college? Did they did yeah. they study science? Uh, our first class, our first camp was in 2016. Mm-hmm. So by now, right, those girls could be in college or on their totally. way to college. I'd really love to know did we have any impact on their future? Or do they remember? What do they yeah. remember about it? Right? right. So yeah, that's what we'd love to do in the future. And we're looking for ways to kind of raise more money so that we can expand in that direction. And if our listeners <laughs> um, wanted to donate, where would they yeah, do that? Yeah, I actually do have a QR code I can I can send you. Perfect. So we can put it on the website. Maybe. That would be great. Yeah, we can put it in the, the bio somewhere. Nate can Ooh, do it you, for us. <laughs> Nate, give us the thumbs up. So if you guys are Fantastic. interested in donating to this incredible uh, camp. I'll just say it's yeah. called DU SciTech. That is the name of the camp. So Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So it's part of the university then. It's sponsored by DU. Yeah, they've given us all the funding oh. so far, except what we've gotten from community. Yeah, that's yeah. so cool. That's so cool. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. And it's great that you mentioned the observatory as an outreach tool. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also the director of Chamberlain Observatory in Denver, which nice. is a historic observatory. Actually, the telescope is really similar to the Clark that, that you have here. It's a oh, little cool. smaller, mm-hmm. but it was all made by the lens maker um, Clark, yeah, mm-hmm. Alvin Clark. And it's a similar vintage. It's 1894. So it's uh-huh. really like kind of a sibling to the yeah. one here. And it is an amazing outreach tool. Like we just mm-hmm. get so many people who come in and... and want to see it, want to spend time, want to hear about it. So, um, and in Denver, it's just situated in a a really, a a neighborhood, you know, it's just just surrounded Mm -hmm. by houses. It's not (laughs) even on campus. Um, It's in a park. So when there's a big event like a lunar eclipse or something, the park fills up with people and everybody, you know, it's just like a festival. That's so cool. (laughs) It's such a happy thing. And I love that we're associating positive emotions with the science, right? Totally, totally. And then you guys also have the Natural Science Museum there. Right. Um, we're actually partners with them, the ASTC program. Oh, so wonderful. our membership uh, actually works at the Natural Science Museum there and vice versa as well. So oh, that's great. Um, yeah. I've actually been there a couple of times. I love it. It's fantastic. I love it there. It's a great place. I love it too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, one so of my cool. one of my current students used to work there, and, and we have a, um, a a professor at DU who used to be there as well. So we have a good partnership with them. It's a fantastic organization. Oh, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Well, um, the the camp sounds fantastic. What you're doing at the Grand Canyon Residency mm-hmm. is super okay. cool. Mm-hmm. But I did want to ask you a little bit about your research. For sure. So you were saying that you study like far away changes. Mm-hmm. What what exactly does that entail? Right. So um, I'm interested in stars. And I always feel a little mm-hmm. weird saying that because like aren't all astronomers <laughs> <laughs> interested in stars? Fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you asking yourselves that question, it's stars as opposed to planets or galaxies mm-hmm. or the Big Bang, there's a lot yeah. of there's a lot of space out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> you have to specialize a little bit. Um, I'm interested in the kinds of stars that eventually explode. Um, and so that means stars that are bigger than our sun, that ha- have a lot more mass in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they explode, it's called a supernova. Um, and those are what we call transient objects. That means they change over time. A supernova will appear. It'll be very bright for a month or a few months or up to a year, and it will gradually fade and and disappear. And, you know, since we started talking about ancient people, ancient people thought these were really miraculous things, right? Because they disrupted the normal patterns of the Mm -hmm. sky, right? And they were thought to be omens. And anyway, there's there's all kinds of cool stuff you can read about them. Um, So it turns out that a supernova comes from when a massive star explodes. And we have a pretty good idea. Scientists know theoretically pretty well how a a single star, like a star that's just all by itself, Mm -hmm. could become a supernova. Basically, the story is that most stars are fusing hydrogen in their in their cores Mm -hmm. and that's creating uh, that fusion reaction is very it creates a lot of heat and it creates a lot of gas pressure and that gas pressure is enough to balance out the gravity of the whole star (laughs) it's like i tell people it's like pumping up your bike tire right yeah your bike tire is just air pressure holding you up right Mm -hmm. (laughs) so in the star it's gas pressure holding the star up against gravity Mm -hmm. but when you run out of fuel for that fusion reaction, uh, you you stop being able to produce that gas pressure. Um, and it's like you have a flat tire, right? Suddenly yeah. you're on the ground. <laughs> and suddenly the star starts to collapse instead of being being supported. Uh-huh. And uh, eventually you get a collapse. So, so you get a collapse. And then eventually you get kind of a rebound because you mm-hmm. cram all the stuff in the star together into yeah. small enough space. It becomes very solid and very, very dense. Mm-hmm. And so the outer layers have to, have to basically bounce off. Yeah. So you get a collapse and then an explosion. Mm-hmm. And that's the story for a star that's all by itself. Mm-hmm. 
Plot twist, though. <laughs> Most massive stars do not sit there and and do this all by themselves. Uh-huh. <laughs> Most massive stars, something like three quarters of them, occur with a friend. Occur in a what we call a binary system, which means two stars that are close enough together that they're affecting each other gravitationally. Like Tatooine. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. Tatooine. It has a double star, a double sun system. Fantastic. Exactly. So, uh, so they're orbiting each other, like like a planet around a around a star or around the sun, mm-hmm. except that you know two stars, and so they kind of both orbit around the middle, mm-hmm. right? Um, and when that happens, the two stars can actually affect each other. So it's gotcha. not like they're just they're just um, going through their lives in isolation. Mm-hmm. They can um, exchange gas between the stars. So if one of them gets really big, um, it could lose material onto the other one. Okay. They can exchange what's called angular momentum. It's basically spin or rotation, mm-hmm. right, between them because there's all this rotating going on in the system. Um, and they can have stellar wind. So the sun has a solar wind, which is just a, a stream of particles off the surface. Mm-hmm. But a massive star has a very powerful, fast stellar wind. Mm-hmm. And if you have two stars like that, then their stellar winds can bump into each other in between ah. and create really interesting shock waves. Cool. So the, all kinds of complicated stuff happens when you have two stars instead of one. Mm-hmm. And that affects the process of becoming a supernova in ways that we don't fully understand yet. Interesting. So, okay. um, So I am studying both binary stars mm-hmm. with stellar wind collisions and supernovae. And, and the fun- funky thing is that they're different populations. So I study the stars that are in the galaxy because they're uh-huh. close enough. Right? Yeah. We can actually, well, we can't, we can't see them with our telescopes as two stars because they're, mm-hmm. they're pretty far away still within the galaxy. Yeah. But they're nearby enough that, you know, we can see them. Where, <laughs> whereas the uh, supernovae that I study are in other galaxies very far away from here. And you can't see the star even before it explodes. Gotcha. So we're trying to draw this connection between these two different phenomena. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there, there really isn't. We're not able to directly uh, link them. It's mm-hmm. called, it's kind of an indirect comparison, right? Right. But we, we think the stars in the galaxy will eventually explode, and yeah. we're pretty sure that the explosions came from stars to begin with, right? Yeah. So we're trying to draw those connections. Um, so uh, the, the link with the Grand Canyon stuff is the binary stars are cyclical. They orbit each other on mm-hmm. a regular mm-hmm. basis with a predictable period, and you can, you, know, you can study them knowing that period. Yeah. And they give rise to a supernova explosion that's a transient. That's something that changes over time. It brightens and then dims. And gotcha. these are timescales that we can appreciate. So the binary stars tend to have a period of like a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And the supernova, like I said, it's a month to a year, mm-hmm. you know. And so this is a change that we can appreciate on a human time scale. So that, cool. I think that's one thing I really like about yeah. it. <laughs> it feels it feels like I can connect to it well, rather than having to think about you know billions and billions right. of years, like, which is just hard to wrap your head around. The galaxy around. far, far away, billions yeah. of years ago. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, I so I've. Uh, looked into binary stars mm-hmm. and I've looked into supernovae uh, just for my job, you know, the things yep. that I talk about and everything. I have never thought to look up what happens with a supernova in a binary system. Yeah. You know, I just, I never really, um, I don't know, it never really occurred to me right. <laughs> um, to like think think about yeah. it. And so that's, that's so interesting. Well, one thing I learned recently is that um, if one of the stars in the binary system explodes, the other one could survive. Like, mm-hmm. apparently there's this population of stars in the Milky Way that are just speeding along at ridiculously <laughs> high velocities, and we don't know why. <laughs> and, like, um, one idea is maybe they just got booted out of the yeah. system, you know, by kicked out by a supernova explosion, and then they're just, they're just running away. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one piece away. of evidence. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, so, um, so with these, uh, like... Uh, supernova and everything, are you just interested in like the actual event of the supernova or the aftermath as well? Uh, I love that you asked that question. Yeah. Um, 
I don't study how the explosion itself happens. There are people that, that do that and mm -hmm. they create really complicated computer models to simulate it. And I, I love to see their, you know, their simulations because they're really, they're really cool. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the, um, the, the, the structure, the shape of the explosion. Actually, I'm really oh. interested in what things look like. Even though they're so far away, we can't mm -hmm. take a picture. Right. But some of my research uh, is, is aimed at reconstructing the shapes of these things even though we can't actually see them. And we do that um, by a technique, I'm going to throw some jargon in here, but a okay. technique called polarimetry, okay? Uh -huh. That's the only, <laughs> hopefully the only <laughs> wacky word I'm going to use today. Um, and polarimetry is basically, it's measuring the amount of polarization in the light. And polarization, okay. just literally like what you get with your sunglasses, yeah. right? Uh, you, when you put your sunglasses on, uh, you, you cut down some light. If you, if you rotate them around, you can see it's brighter and dimmer depending yeah. on what you're looking at. So some light has a preferred orientation mm -hmm. that um, your polarized sunglasses are blocking that, blocking certain orientations of light. Mm -hmm. And that orientation, that alignment is produced by certain physical processes in the systems that we're studying. I don't want to get into all the de gory details, but yeah. the, <laughs> the point is that the polarization can tell us about the shape of the gas in the system. Cool. Okay. It contains geometrical information <laughs> that's encoded in the light, right, uh, that we can extract without actually having an image to work with. We nice. just have to know how to interpret the polarization. And I do that partly with some computer models as well. So uh -huh. it's not, it's not, you know, it's not one-to-one. -one. It's not super easy. But yeah. But um, we do know how light behaves. We take these I, we take these known quantities about how light behaves and how it becomes polarized, and we mm -hmm. apply them in these situations to understand, yeah, what what the what the system looked like uh, cool. that created the light, right? Yeah. So in the binary systems, I'm wondering like, what does the what does the wind collision region look like, mm -hmm. um, and where is the gas in the system if if the stars are exchanging gas, where is it? It's flying around somewhere in between yeah. or outside the stars where their shells or their outflows or what have you. We, mm -hmm. We're trying to describe those shapes. Mm -hmm. And with the supernova, I'm trying to say, if this came from a binary system, are there still structures left that we can identify in the ejecta, in the supernova explosion mm -hmm. that would tell us, yeah, this was a binary star, right? Cool. Maybe there's some remnant. It's kind of like archaeology. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a remnant structure left over that we can identify as having Astro. been a binary. Astroarchaeology. Yeah, right? That's what cool. you do. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So um, we've talked about this a little bit on our podcast before. Um, we've talked about supernovas a little bit, um, because we did an episode on black holes. Ooh, fun. So I am assuming that your systems that you study do not create black holes. They create neutron stars. That's a great question. Mostly mm -hmm. neutron stars, I yeah. think. Um, but <laughs> I couldn't swear that some of them don't make black holes. We Fair. do. We are working with some of the, the brightest and, and most energetic super Nice. Rare. And yeah, I think you, you could get a black hole out of some of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally, totally. I'm so um they, they make fun of me here. I'm known as the black hole girl. I have a tattoo of a black hole. Look at um, that. <laughs> I'm obsessed. Um yeah. and so I, anytime in the podcast, I'm able to bring up black holes. <laughs> you I will. do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we did an entire episode on them uh, this season. So uh, season two. And I talked a little bit about supernovae and how they can create black holes mm -hmm. if they're like the largest of the largest stars, right? right? And so um, it sounds like you're studying some of those like really, really big stars. We're getting yeah. up there. Yeah. I'm not thinking very much about black holes, although well, yeah. it is one of the most common questions that I yeah. get just as an astronomer. <laughs> Um, but one thing I'm really interested in is, well, okay, so there's two things. Mm -hmm. um, one is that some supernovae can create what we call gamma ray bursts. Yes. And those are very, very energetic supernovae that we detect, again, as a transient, right, mm -hmm. with, uh, with super high energy radiation. Mm -hmm. And the current theory about gamma ray bursts is that they can have all of that energy going out, but only in a very thin kind of... Um, uh, beam, right? Mm -hmm. And you only see it if the beam is pointed at you. So that's why right. they're pretty rare. Yeah. So I'm looking for this, you know, signatures of those supernovae. And some people mm -hmm. think that you might need binary stars to create that in the gotcha. first place. Uh, the other thing I think is really cool about what these supernovae could become is uh, maybe you've talked about this too that we, we've recently astronomers have recently detected gravitational waves uh, so from not inspiring yet, neutron but... stars in spiraling black holes. Okay, that's a great topic for future. Yes, <laughs> future we reference. might have like briefly touched on it because we talked about colliding black holes in uh, season yeah, one. Right. 
Um, but we definitely haven't done like an episode on it. Okay, so, so. it's a thing. Like this is a very hot yeah. area of, yeah. <laughs> of science. And I know that, you know, people who like science are very interested in this. Totally. How do you get those gravitational wave signatures? You got to have a binary, right? It's mm-hmm. either, a, you know, so two neutron stars, two black holes, or one of each. Yeah. And where does that come from? Well, it had to be a binary star before it, before it you know, regular stars before it became neutron yeah. stars or black holes. So, so I think the systems I'm studying are progenitors of the, of the gravitational wave binaries. Oh, that's so cool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. I yeah, just, yeah. I get really excited <laughs> about this Sometimes we just have to stuff. let our minds be blown. <laughs> right? Sometimes I, I, so it's funny that you said that because usually like I'm blowing Cody's mind on here because <laughs> um, I put together like the really science-y outlines and everything. So like the black hole episode, we did an episode on spectroscopy, things like that, where it's just me and her sitting down. Usually I'm blowing her mind. And so it's really nice to have my bl- my mind blown yeah. every once in a while, you know? So I think I would say that <laughs> that might be part of what I, why I became a scientist, just so that yeah. I can get my mind blown now and then. Like, so I just cool. had a really nice lunch with the, the, the astronomers here at Lowell Observatory. Oh, good. And they their research covers a whole range of things that I don't know anything about. And oh, I yeah. like, and that com- you know, we had like a 45 minute conversation and I had like three different mind blowing experiences. Right? Like, wow, you want to put a telescope on the moon? That's yeah. Crazy. Oh, wow, you're detecting like centimeters per second velocities in, yeah. in, <laughs> in exoplanets. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. yeah. So that, uh, people are doing fantastic stuff and I love hearing about it. Yeah, <laughs> no, we've had a couple of our astronomers on here before and um, it would be a wasted episode episode if I didn't mention Gerard Van Bell. Uh, we, He's we the have, one with the telescope on the moon. Yes, of course he is because it's Gerard. We have yeah. this ongoing joke that we bring him up every episode and there's this like <laughs> – <laughs> There's this lost episode with Gerard Van Bell we recorded at the very beginning of when we were doing the podcast, and something happened to the audio, oh, no. and the file got corrupted, oh, so no. we never got to actually post it. And he's it. never come back? So he, he's he been on uh, the podcast oh, okay. once, but like we make this <laughs> ongoing joke to bring him up every every episode, <laughs> so... Sure. Um, there are some, there are some that we've missed, uh, but you know, most of them <laughs> have, to have a theme. <laughs> yeah. But you said, you said telescope on the moon and I was like, I bet you yep, anything I know that, that is, is yep. Gerard because <laughs> of all, all the, uh, of all the astronomers here at Lowell, it would be Gerard. It would be. <laughs> well, um, it looks like we are running out of time. Okay. I just got the signal from Nate back there. Um, so before we wrap up, I uh, did want to ask you, so if anybody has any um, questions about anything that we've talked about today, you know, uh, the camp that you run, anything like that, uh, do you have anywhere that they could reach you? Oh, yeah, for sure. So my email address is just jennifer.hoffman at du.edu, du for University of Denver. That's I don't know why they switch it around, but they do. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would love to to be a resource for your audience for sure wicked awesome then we will um add your email um if that's okay with you uh we also have a discord channel for the uh podcast so we'll we'll put it in there for sure um and that reminds me um those of you listening and watching if you guys haven't already uh joined our discord you definitely should we have a lot of really cool behind the scenes content in there including um any images that we've referenced in the uh episodes uh we also just have a bunch of Lowell educators and uh, astronomers in there who are constantly waiting to answer any questions you guys might have. So um, just, just sitting around. <laughs> exactly. They're just like staring at their computer yeah. waiting. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm so bored. <laughs> but the Discord is pretty active, so uh, definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on yeah. the epi- uh, on the podcast. Thank this you was so much for having me. Such a fun episode. Um, we talked about some of my favorite things on here, so I had a Excellent. great time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks well, so much. thank you guys again so much for listening and uh, tune in next time. This podcast was made possible by our members and donors. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our nonprofit in making more digital education like this available, go to lowell.edu slash donate. Thanks for listening. <laughs>